Hello, I'm Michael Boskin. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and professor of economics at Stanford University. I also chaired the President's Council of Economic Advisors under President George H.W. Bush. I'm often asked why it would be better, as most economists propose, broadening the tax base and lowering the rates compared to our current tax system. Our current tax system is a hodgepodge of special deductions, credits, uh, mandates, incentives, complicated rules that mean because we have less that's being taxed, the rates have to be higher to collect the same revenue. If we got rid of most or all even of those special interest breaks, many of them popular and some affecting a lot of people, some affecting a very narrow group of people, um, we could lower the rates substantially and that would cause far fewer inefficiencies and anti-growth features of our economy it would improve the overall performance of the economy by eliminating a lot of distortions in uh, where and how people work, how much they work, how firms hire, uh, who they hire, where they hire them, uh, how much people save, how much uh, firms invest, and things of that sort. So it's often said that the ideal base is very broad taxing almost all economic activity, not exempting a lot of things, uh, and having a lower rate structure. It can be a progressive structure. It doesn't have to be one rate. It can be, like our current system, uh, a series of rates that rise with income or spending or some other measure of economic uh, well-being. But lower rates, good for the economy. Everybody benefits from a strong economic growth. I'm also often asked, is it possible to do this, broaden the base and lower the rates in a way that maintains progressivity in the tax code that doesn't shift a lot of a burden onto lower and uh, lower middle income people? And the answer is a resounding yes, of course. In fact, many of the deductions primarily benefit people in higher tax brackets because the value of a deduction is higher if you have a higher tax rate. If you're deducting something against a, the top 39.6% rate, that's more valuable. You get more dollars of tax savings than if you're doing it against a 10 or 15% rate. So it, it certainly is possible to do that. And of course, you can tailor which things you broaden to reinforce that. But in general, uh, lower rates on a broader base would apply to all taxpayers. Now, it is true that people at the bottom pay very little income taxes. Uh, and therefore, this wouldn't affect them. They're not paying many too much taxes anyway. It would have very little effect on them. But again, the people who primarily benefit from uh, the many uh, special exemptions in the code, many of which are very popular, uh, we're now talking, for example, about limiting uh, state and local income taxes in the, um, in the tax code. If that is done, then we'll wind up uh, affecting most higher income people, not uh, low and middle income people with either no, a zero tax rate or a very small tax rate. So people like me in California will uh, pay much higher taxes if this indeed passes. Low income Californians will not pay higher taxes. Another question I get is why should we care about marginal tax rates as opposed to average tax rates? First, let's make sure we we're, understand what we're talking about. The marginal tax rate is what you pay if you make an additional dollar of income or additional hundred dollars or if you uh, work a little overtime or take a second job or if a spouse goes to work part time. That's added to your income and so you're taxed at the level of the tax rate that you would have gotten or even higher if you move into a higher tax bracket. That's the marginal rate. The average rate takes your total taxes you pay and divides it by your total income. And the marginal rate is often, matter of fact, almost always above the average rate. And uh, in a, we, we can define progressivity in either of those ways, but in general, we tend to define progressivity in both, that the marginal rate rises with income and that the average rate rises with income. It's very important to appreciate that many economic decisions are primarily affected by the marginal tax rate. That is, a, a spouse thinking of going to work part-time 
won't be looking at the average tax rate on the income, including that that their spouses earn. They'll look at what effect they're going to work and earning that extra income, what tax rate will be paid on that, which is the marginal rate. So it's very important to appreciate the fact that marginal rates are very, very important for how the tax codes affect economic activity and the performance of the economy, as well as the behavior and the well-being of individuals and families. I'm also asked, why do economists usually favor taxing consumption or the part of the income that people consume rather than uh, all of your income? And the answer is a very simple and straightforward one, but a little subtle. That is, an income tax doubly taxes saving. You first pay a tax on your income when you earn it, then when you save it and earn a return, interest or dividends or something of that sort, it's taxed again. And that's a bad distortion in how much people save, which is important for not just today versus tomorrow, but saving for their children's college education or saving for their retirement. These are important long-term decisions. And a, that double tax, when you compound it over the length of time, the time horizon in saving for your child's education or your own retirement is extremely distortive. Um, and, and therefore, economists prefer uh, netting that out by taxing only the part of income that is consumed. Now, people are concerned that because people at the top tend to save more, that they will, uh, this will reduce progressivity. But that can be addressed in many, many ways. And there are two types of uh, generic types of consumption taxes. One are sales taxes or value-added taxes, such as exist in Europe, uh, which exempt saving and investment, which therefore leaves you with income minus investment, which is uh, consumption. Or you could have a progressive consumed income tax, which is a type of tax I prefer, I think is best, where we would take something like our current tax code, broaden the base sum, but then we'd have a, an expanded exclusion of saving like we currently have for a modest amount of money put into an IRA or 401k. So when you subtract saving from income, you wind up with that part of income which is consumed. And this is neutral with respect to whether you save or consume it now or later, whether it's, it's, uh, it's neutral between people who are patient and saving for their future and people who are impatient and spending now. Uh, and that is probably the single biggest concern we have about taxes and growth or the effect on saving and investment. So it's important not just in this way. And finally, there's a very long uh, philosophical tradition dating back to Thomas Hobbes in England and many of the leading philosophers and political philosophers over time have mentioned this, that if we're taxing people on what they consume, we're taxing them on what they're taking out of society's output. If we're taxing on their income, we're taxing on what they produce. And it's better to tax people on what they take out so we don't discourage that production. I'm also often asked, why do we pay so much attention to government spending when we talk about taxes? Aren't they separate things? And the answer is, not quite. Importantly, not quite. Why is that? Because the government eventually has to pay it bill, its bills. So if the government spends an additional billion dollars and only raises 900 million in taxes, it's going to have to borrow an additional 100 million dollars. But that means it's going to have to make interest payments on those uh, that borrowing in the future, which is going to require higher taxes then or cutting spending then. So government spending and taxes are intimately related in this way by what economists call the government's budget constraint. Now, the government has this printing press at the Fed, at, at the central bank, and it has the ability to borrow money. So it has less day-to-day -day budget balancing pressure than a family, but over time it must, or it would have to go bankrupt or declare insolvency or renege on its debt payments. Some countries have done that. The United States has never done that, and it's unthinkable that the United States would renege on the full faith and credit of its government bonds. So therefore, over time, the gov every time the government commits to spend, it's going to have to raise taxes now or in the future to support that spending. If it, that's, uh, unless it cuts spending again in the future. 
So there's an intimate relationship between spending and taxes, which means that we could have a very good tax reform that helps the economy now, but if spending, which is currently projected at the U.S. federal government level to grow and grow and grow because of entitlement cost explosion, if that continues, then taxes eventually will have to rise. So in some very fundamental sense, spending control is necessary to have true effective permanent tax reform that keeps tax rates and the tax burden on American people and, and families and, and firms modest. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I look forward to any additional questions you have. Please leave them in the box below.